First of all, as Tech said, for me, I spend a lot more time in the bush and technology isn't what I spend a lot of time on. So you're going to have to forgive me as I work my way through this and, and help you out. And hopefully you've got lots of questions for us at the end of it. I think one of the major things is... All right. So I want to we... share my screen with you yeah. over here. Tech, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen clearly. Wonderful. So welcome. We're going to be chatting about migrations and especially focusing on Africa. Now, animal migrations, to give you a bit of background, people go on safari, they travel around, but you have these unique occurrences where large numbers of animals, insects, birds, whatever it might be, travel these huge distances. Now, no, over lockdown, I've been battling to, to travel around a bit, but it's incredible to see these animals still moving around a lot. Just to give you an idea of the, the areas where we to sort of operate and where they, I've got to do work, I'm based over here, hopefully you can see my screen, in South Africa, and we're going to spend time mostly focused on Africa, but I have got to do a lot of work in South America and in Asia as well. As I was saying earlier, migration timing is everything. And it's been very fortunate that the Intrigue team and, and beyond have put together this little easy to use calendar to really help you plan your trip and maximize the opportunities of not just seeing the normal animals that you get to see on safari, but to hopefully touch base and get to see some of these incredible migrations that happen. We're gonna chat about a couple of them today in our webinar. The main ones we're going to focus on, or the main area we're going to focus on, is going to be up in Kenya, Tanzania. We're going to spend time in the plains of Botswana over here and dip into the ocean, the Indian Ocean of the South African coast. And just to make you all really jealous, I'm sitting, as we are at the moment, on one of our game reserves, Pinda Private Game Reserve, which is really, really special. So to help get you over from Asia across to South Africa, I want to introduce you to this incredible little bird over here, the Amur falcon. It starts up in northern Mongolia, where its breeding ground is. It's where they have all their chicks. And these little Amur falcons will feed on things such as rodents, mice, frogs, insects, and then they start their 14,500 kilometer trek right across India, down into South Africa. You can see the little area that Nagaland, where we've highlighted, it's quite a critical zone for these birds, the Amur falcon, because there's so many, they flock by the thousand, and there are a lot of people that actually catch them and use them as a food source. So there's a lot of education programs going on to help encourage people to allow these birds to continue on their migration. They get down to us in the Southern Hemisphere for their summer, for our summer, where we have these incredible eruptions of termites, flying ants, and that's pretty much what they feed on from then on. So it's really incredible to see during summer these wonderful birds coming down and visiting us. From there, these Birds do migrate back up north on a slightly higher trajectory. There's a locust migration that they meet, and they get to feed on these migratory locusts before heading back up to Mongolia. Unfortunately, not all these birds have great directions, and we've had some birds that have ended up in Europe as well, unbeknownst to them. Moving more locally, now that you've all hitched a ride on an Amur falcon here to Southern Africa, we've got one of the most beautiful little birds that I really enjoy, the carmine bee eater. These colorful sort of pink and blues on it are just really spectacular. This bird doesn't migrate across continents, but it is what we call an altitudinal migrant. So it starts from higher areas and drops down, as it gets cooler, it drops down to the lower areas where it's a bit warmer, closer to the coastline. I also really love these carmine bee eaters because when we have long grass on the African plains and we're really battling to find rhino or buffalo in the long grass, 
you look out for this little carmine bee heater and it follows things like buffalo and rhino and catches up any little insects that have been kicked up by them. So a really, really spectacular small bird to get to see. My last that I had to put in, flamingos. The greater flamingo is just one of the most colorful bird to me. Those bright, bright pink colors and to see the flocks of them by their hundreds. And the best place for us to, to find them is to head up sort of up into East Africa where there's some other migrations that we'll chat about in, in due course. But to, to get there at the beginning of the year and as lakes start drying out in parts of Africa, parts of East Africa, you have these flamingos congregating to places like Lake Manyara around April, May, June of the year, because there's a lot of water, a lot of food resources for them. And to be able to go on game drive and to park and look out and see what you're seeing in front of you now, just all these birds sticking around is really, really spectacular to see. So something where people often think, oh, migrations, let's go and look at animals. The birds are definitely one of the most colorful migrants and things to look at, especially when they make big flocks like this. We're going to move forward. There's a video that I'm going to share with you. I know the screen's black, but we're going to start now. And I'm going to introduce you to probably some migrations that a lot of you have already seen. And if you haven't yet seen, I really encourage you to go and do it. It's up in East Africa. It's a wildebeest migration. And as I said, it's, it's one of the migrations that a lot of people know about. So starting in January, these sort of pink, so these greener areas, I'm saying pink because I can't get flamingos out of my mind, but these sort of green areas, I'm just going to use a, apologies, I'm just going to use this to show you. Down here, these blue areas and further up into the Serengeti National Park is where the herds start migrating at the beginning of the year. The reason they've come down here, a lot of people will say, oh, they followed the, the rains to get down there. This is true. The grass has improved. But one of the biggest reasons for it is around Lake Ndutu. It's my favorite place to go. It's where the, the carving season happens. There are huge volcanoes, ancient volcanoes in that area, and all that volcanic ash that forms the soil are really rich in nutrients. And when these wildebeest eat the grass there, it's really good for milk production, which means there's a higher chance of survival for their, their calves. I'm going to start playing the video, and as you'll see it, you'll see how these colors, the green colors, start moving up past the Grumeti area, up past Clans Camp into Kenya, where it's what a lot of people talk about seeing, seeing the Mara River crossings. It's what everyone talks about. But to visit this migration through the year at the different times is really spectacular to see. Here you can see them moving up towards Grumeti, Clans Camp, and eventually up towards August, the end of the year, back up before heading to follow the rains back south. Just picture yourself in one of these game drive vehicles, driving around, seeing these wildebeest migrating, starting to walk, covering these huge distances, whether it's with the youngsters after the breeding season or just to head down to the Ndutu plains, which are really open like this, for them to start their calving season. You can see in this image, some rangers sent to me recently, just showing how dry the grass is and what drives these wildebeest to start moving. They're really looking for that more lush sort of green grass that they can feed on. When they do find, if you look at the grass where they're standing now, the grass is a lot greener. And because of that, they'll slow down their movements. They'll feed, they'll lie down, but still congregating in these massive herds with the odd little zebra moving between them. All these eyes and ears out is really great to help pick up on predators like lions that might be following them. So although you go to see the migration and these massive sort of herds of wildebeest, it's stunning to see the other predators that move into the area or follow along after them. 
just these beautiful visuals of the open plains, which is quite different to other game reserves. And as I say, everyone focuses on wanting to see river crossings, but to just see these animals, to, to glance out over the plains, whether it be on game drive or in a balloon safari over these plains, is just really, really spectacular. As the wildebeest get closer to, to the rivers, they generally congregate because there are certain crossing points that they prefer. They've learned it's easier to cross at some of these points. So they would have built up their strength, been feeding as they move along, being aware of predators, hopefully letting sort of the other zebra that are around them join in, the other wildebeest follow with them. And it's an incredible spectacle to see. They talk of there being up to 1.7 million, 1.7 million wildebeest that move around. Then after calving season, that goes up to just over 2 million. So another 500,000 wildebeest that sort of join them. It really is spectacular. Here they got onto the banks of the river. And I'll just let you feast your eyes on this a little bit as we watch them drop down and they'll start crossing the rivers which is what people see. This is often quite a dangerous time for these wildebeest. It's where the lions wait to prey on them, where there are crocodiles in the river, but just stunning to see them cross rivers like this. This is a bit of handheld footage from one of my rangers on a recent crossing. The hippos in the water, the crocodiles, these, the chaos of the wildebeest swimming across, climbing the banks to get out. It really gets your heart going, the noise of the wildebeest, and just to see those sheer, sheer numbers of them is really, really spectacular. And I'm sure those of you that have got to, to go and experience it have enjoyed these sort of moments, which is really, really special. Now that we've had a bit of time to see the wildebeest migration in East Africa, I want to bring you further down south of Africa to, to Botswana. To, to an area that's pretty spectacular. And for a number of reasons, this has been, I had to share it with you because it's one of the hottest places that I am sort of dying to get to see. And I'd really recommend this to all of you. And it's a zebra migration. And I'm gonna give you a bit of a background to it. I'm gonna show you some points on the map here before we get going on the video of zebra and what it might be like there. Historically, Hopefully you can all see my pointer. There was one migration from the Chobe Linyanti River up in the north here that used to move down to the what's called the Nai Pans. All of this brown area is areas under conservation. And that wildebeest migration, so zebra migration, people have seen for years and years. But what's more interesting for me and the real jewel and something special to see right now is in the sort of mid 90s in this area over here where it's white it was community land and the government was forced to put up fences to stop what's called foot and mouth disease spreading from the wildlife across to um, the cattle in the area and so this migration this herd of zebras historically migrated down to the gadi gadi pans down here prior to the 1960s then the fences went up and this whole migration was cut off. No more zebra migrated. They all stayed locally in the Okavango Delta, which in itself is a spectacular area. Come 2004, the government removed all the fences. In that population of zebra, which was now 40 years later, considering a zebra only lives for 15 years, there were no zebra in that population that was still alive that had done the migration before in the year 2004. And after four years, so in 2007, 2008, all of a sudden in this area, we started seeing these zebra migrating the old historical routes down to the Kari Kari pans over here. Another interesting thing is when I play the video, you'll be able to see how the population splits in two. Half of them stay in the delta and half of them move back on their original sort of migration routes. 
And it's pretty incredible because scientists still to this day can't explain it. Now, the best time to get to see this is over the March period when it's a lot drier and the zebra have left the delta. There's been sort of rains down towards the Makarikari pans and they start moving in that area. So it's to time it as it's been drier and we've had good rains come through and the grass starts growing and these zebra head down to the pan systems to start feeding. So it's really, really spectacular. And that's generally the, a good time in sort of March, April is to see them. I'm gonna press play so we can enjoy a bit of a video of how they move around the Botswana area. And then a bit of video feed on Zebra that I'll chat to you about. So we can see the green masses as they start moving across. It's about 250 kilometers that they travel over a period of sort of two weeks to four weeks. And then they'll spend about 80 days in those areas feeding on their rich grasses after all the rains. And then they'll take another two months to head back up into the Delta. These are some of the most beautiful things to go on a safari early in the morning, spend time. This is before the migration starts happening. You'll have these small little family groups of zebra just like this. You'll have a stallion and he's got a few mares that are with him. And slowly he'll defend them. If he has any youngsters, the mares look after them. I followed this, I filmed this for you. We followed this, this little family group for a little while as the stallion was defending his mares from other males coming in. And we actually found a female with a little foal who spent time feeding early in the morning. And this is what they'll do. Out in the open grasslands, they'll be feeding. The young might be suckling from the mother. If you look very carefully to the zebra in the background, you can just, just see the youngster over there as it's suckling. It's really, really special to see. These plain zebra start gathering and mass then for the migration. And this is them starting to move. So we've got a couple of aerial shots just to show the open grassland, how spectacular it is, how they need to get down to this water to drink. You can see the big game trails in the pans as they're walking along through the grasslands. Really, really is just quite spectacular to see. Where possible, they'll use roads to move on. You might have other animals that for safety, like these wildebeest, might move with them, which is really also adds to the excitement of seeing all of these zebra moving along. When you're looking at these herds of zebra, you've also got to look for the very different and unexpected. I'm going to pause here. This is a zebra, like I said, the unexpected within a herd of zebra. We had a photographer, Rahul Sajdev, that got this incredible video footage. And I just want to play it again for you of a young zebra that just it got born differently. It was a genetic morph. So when you're sitting enjoying these massive herds of zebra, remember to also look for the detail amongst the zebras. See what's different. You'll find zebras with different patterns and crazy looking things. So this is just really something different and special to see. I'm going to pause us now. If you do spend time in the Delta when it's a lot more water around, when they're up around the actual panhandle, you might have times where you get to go on game drive or else in Makoro like this, which is pretty spectacular to see. And then there are a few images to show you from the water where it's really wet to when it gets really, really dry. These zebras wade deep into the water, the dust getting picked up because the grass is getting less and less compared to the summer months when it's nice and wet. So you can see really the difference, summer, winter. And of course, incredible predators like lion or wild dog that might follow after these zebra to, to hunt them. So we've got to spend time in the skies. We've got to spend time on the land with the wildebeest and with the, the zebra around sort of the March period. And now we're about to, to hit a time now going into April, May, which is actually happening as we speak, is we get what's called the sardine run. It's a small fish. I'm going to show you footage, but I just want to show you where it happens and what drives this process. 
So the sardines sit way offshore of South Africa. They really prefer cold water. This Benguela, Benguela current moves up the coast from the Arctic regions. You get a warm current, the Gallus current that moves down. And every now and again, during this time of the year, you get this incredibly cold patch of water that forms here and gets sucked up over April, May to, to um, take things like uh, small little insects, so it's small little plankton to move up the coast. And it's these that cause the sardines to follow them. We're gonna go into a video to just show you when the sardine runs start and they start moving up the coast, how you'd be able to go out on a boat to be able to see them. If you're brave enough, you can put on a pair of goggles and snorkels and dive underwater to enjoy the sights underwater for a change or using scuba gear, you could go underwater. So going across here, we're gonna show you what it is that all these fish follow. It's these little plankton that they really love. The water temperature drops to 21 degrees Celsius and you have these fish, those black lines are all the fish gathering. You get massive pods, super pods of dolphins that start moving in after the shoals of fish as they come inshore. You get a bird called the Cape Gannet that can see the fish from above and drop down underwater up to four or five meters deep and start swimming under to see these shoals of fish. When we talk of the wildebeest migration being 1.7 million, the zebra migration of being hundreds of thousands, those are all totally eclipsed by the numbers of sardines, sort of over 10 million sardines swimming around with these dolphins following after them. There are all sorts of predators. The dolphins will move into the big sort of shoal of fish and try and chase them into small little, little, little groups that we call bait balls, like you're seeing on the screen, because it makes it easier for them to predate, to fish, to catch them. You also have dusky sharks that come hunting for these fish. A lot of you might be nervous thinking there's no way I dip my toe in the water to even attempt to swim around. But these sharks are so sort of involved with the, the shoals that they aren't interested in you. We'll show you a moment what the surface looks like. If you're still sitting on the boat, this is what you might see. The sharks coming through the surface, catching these little fish to feed on them, to spend their time eating them. It's a really, really spectacular to see. They're bonitos, they are tuna that come in and feed on these shoals of fish as they slowly move up the coast. It takes them about two months to slowly move up the coast, so a very small window of opportunity to get into the country, to get to see them, but definitely what we call one of the greatest, instead of greatest shows on earth, one of the greatest shoals on earth. To see those silver colors as they move in unison, to see what looks like an oil stick in the water that is actually made up of fish is really, really spectacular and special to see. I love the way you can see how they just part away from any fish that swims past them, any predator that comes past. They'll just move and let dolphins come through, sharks come through. And if it wasn't bad enough, as I said before, having all those attacking from below, dropping out of the skies, these Cape Gannets, cormorants coming down to fish and catch whatever they can. Just some stunning sort of footage of them moving through. Over here is a still picture. This was taken by one of our underwater photographers that if you were to do this, you, you would join them. He's got great experience, but just shows you how all the fish move away from a shark as it comes past. So apologies for that. The next thing I want to do is those are some of the major migrations to, to get to see when you have. But there are a couple of bonus migrations that happen in and around these times that are definitely something you can, you can add on to. 
One of these is the topi. It's a beautiful antelope that people often overlook. They go and see the wildebeest, wildebeest migration in East Africa, and they'll sit and watch and fight to go and see the big crossings at the rivers, which is exciting to see. But what's often overlooked is these topi migrations, which actually follow the huge herds of wildebeest. You get these massive groups of topi, they're incredibly fast animals. It's one of the prey species that cheetah would definitely hunt. So to go and spend time with the herds of topi, which will number up to half a million topi busy following the wildebeest migration is really spectacular to see as well. A chance to see things like cheetah, lots of vultures moving around possibly. And just those colors, those dark faces is, is quite stunning to see. Normally the male topis during the migration, they'll walk around and they'll find like a small little termite mound or a little high point that they love to stand on to kind of show off, try and attract females. And they just have these thousands of females walking past them. So quite a challenge for them. But as I said, something to definitely to add on that you get to see in Tanzania and the Brunetti area, especially around January, February, that sort of time of the year. Another migration that I'm very fortunate to, to get to experience once a year, being here at Pinder Game Reserve, this migration happens towards the end of our year. So going into November, December, and into to January is a really spectacular one. It's a turtle migration. Now, a lot of people have seen turtles and know sort of greenback turtles and things like that, which aren't too big. This little picture here is of a loggerhead turtle, sorry, a leatherback turtle, a leatherback turtle. I was actually down at our beaches about a month ago and managed to, to find one. They weigh less at this age. They're just hatchlings that have come out of their nests after being in the nest for 120 days. And they're moving down to the, the water to swim out to sea, and hundreds of them in the nest. And what will happen is as they start heading out to sea, they'll get predated on by a large number of fish and things like that. These leatherbacks will go and feed on jellyfish. They might move as far afield as um, Australia in their trips and travels around. And eventually, 27 years later, to 28 years later, coming to the exact same beach that this little leatherback turtle was born on is the adult. This is what they grow up to be. It's the size of, to put it in perspective, maybe a water buffalo or an African buffalo, sort of 800 kilograms, so something that maybe weighed less than a cup of tea becoming so huge. It's really incredible and spectacular to see. We get to drive from Pinda and you go up and down the beaches. As we said, timing's everything. It's got to be over that November, December period where these adults have, have spent 27 years out to sea. And they swim back to the shore and they crawl all the way up the shore. They'll dig a nest. And that's where the females will lay their eggs before returning back to the ocean. And they might do this four, five, six times over that November, December period. And then by January, the hatchlings start coming out. So, so it's a month incubation period. Uh, I said 120, it's about 120 eggs that are laid, but it's about just over a month incubation period before those young hatchlings come out. To get to see these huge leatherback turtles that feed on jellyfish is really, really incredible to see. The males, on the other hand, will never come back to shore. The rest of their life, so far, we've been running a project on recording how long they live for. We've had a, an animal that was tagged, and we've seen it over 70 years. It's still alive. So it's really a dinosaur that spends time out to sea, and on the very odd occasion, comes back to the shore to, to lay its eggs. So to get to see them again, another absolutely spectacular thing to do. Sticking with the coast while you're out, joining the sardine run, or if you're further down the coast at a place called Vimanis, uh, during the sardine run, you get over this winter period, what is our winter period now, going into June, July, August, humpback whales. 
They come in right up against the coastline, not too far off, and they start trekking way down the coastline towards the Cape, towards the colder water. They're looking for some of that same plankton that we were talking about earlier. And so to be out either on a boat or just to be on the shore to get to, to look out to see and enjoy these tails or to see these massive animals breaching out of the water is definitely something to put on your bucket list of things to do. One of the largest sort of species that you can see of our coastline is the humpback whale, bigger than a few elephants put together. So definitely something for everyone. I'm gonna take us now a little bit further inland from South Africa, up past Botswana to Zambia. To me, this is another incredible migration that absolutely blows my mind. It's a fruit bat migration. So we sort of started with what happens in the sky and I wanna bring us towards an end this, with this webinar of what kind of back in the sky again, but with a different species, with these fruit bats. And what's incredible about these fruit bats is they spread out all over Zambia, which is just north of Botswana. And you'll have them slowly up to season. They come down to an area called the Kasanka Marsh, to the Kasanka National Park. And there's a small marshland there with some wonderful trees with lots of fruit and little berries on them, lots of seeds. And as they, they start over the November, December period, coming together just for that small little window, you might sit out and you'll see in this little marshland, which is really small, sort of 100 meters by 100 meters. We've been talking about, you know, looking for migrations that are stretched over hundreds of kilometers, animals that might move 14,000 kilometers, animals that you've got to look for across 50 kilometers to find them. These bats gather together in great numbers, over one hectare. So it's about 100 meters by 100 meters, this little marshland. And the trees, if you could picture all the big trees in a marsh and around a marshland, instead of leaves on the trees, you've got in the late afternoon these bats just hanging. And it will start 1,000, 2,000, 100,000, 500,000, up until they're about over a million bats that start sort of flying into these trees. So really, really spectacular to see and something I'd really recommend that is totally different to a lot of the animals that everyone talks about. We're gonna go back and have a closer look at it. Just that beautiful muscle, it's like a little flying fox almost. To see them fly down into the trees, flip upside down, hang on, to the trees or I was feeding on the fruit and to see the scars turn gray with these little bats is something you need to put on your bucket list. So just one more time to, to share with you about how timing is everything. We've got this little calendar app and the team tech and a team at Intrigue and Emmeline from Angon, they, they're always willing to, to help to advise which is the best time to travel. Depending on when you want to travel, what you want to see, you might have to time it with a migration that's happening. If you're limited with time, you can travel. They'll definitely try and find something special for you. A lot of people often ask me sort of what is my favorite, what is on my personal bucket list? And it is that zebra migration that we're talking about to see zebras sort of moving that had no idea where these migrations happened have grown up and suddenly just something in them gets them walking in a particular direction for 250 kilometers to get to an area that they never ever knew is something really special to me. It's something that really makes my mind query these migrations and how it all happens. And so hopefully you've enjoyed this little presentation about migrations. And I just wanted to, to thank you for giving you my time, for giving me your time, sorry. And if you've got any questions, please, Tech will do her best to point them in my direction, and I'll do my best to answer them.